What's up, guys? I'm Cody Brockway, and you're back here for another episode of Brockway's Vinyl Bites, baby. Woohoo! It has been quite some time since we made an episode like this, and uh, so sorry for the delay, but thank you for hanging on. And I see you new subscribers that are here, ooh, rocking in the free world of Brockway's Vinyl Bites. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your support. I love y'all so much. And we are here today talking about my top favorite keyboardists. This is mostly in the prog vein, rock prog maybe a bit of metal you know so that's you know if, if you don't see people like billy joel and elton john i love those guys very much but uh this is mostly prog centric here today now naturally there's so many keyboardists especially in the prog realm that you're not going to be able to cover them all in one video so i'm going to have to do another another one of these uh, a bit down the road but i got 15 here that come to mind that i just love so much and i have to mention to you of course not all of them are prog with a capital p some of them are prog adjacent like number 15 is brent midland from the grateful dead yes he joined them in 1979 Stepping in after Keith Godshow stepped down and consequently, unfortunately, died. R.I.P. Keith. Uh, but he was a he was a great keyboardist. I, I love the sounds that he got. I love the way that I love the way that he played and gelled with the band, especially during the live '80s stuff. And uh, he was a good singer too. So he he sang some tunes like "Blow Away" and such. He sang lead, and his background vocals really helped give a different dimension to the song, as well as his awesome keyboard playing. Big fan of Brent. So that's Brent at number 15 from the Grateful Dead. Number 14 is a tie. It's a tie between two guys who are from the same band, I have to tell you. Now, I'm new to this band. If you've been following Brockway's Vinyl Bites or if you've been following uh, Scott Lade over on the Prog Corner, I featured with him num uh, numerous times. And uh, we've talked about this band and uh, how him and, uh, and some people from the panels over there kind of got me into this group. Uh, but uh, number 14... Is a tie between Hugh Banton and Peter Hamill. What a unique sound those guys make. Peter Hamill, awesome keyboardist, as is as is his cohort Hugh. But uh, you know Peter Hamill does a lot of the writing too, right? And so it's it's him coming up with a lot of a lot of the ideas, to my knowledge, anyway. But uh, yeah, Peter Hamill and Hugh Banton from Vandergraaff Generator share the number fourteen spot. Number thirteen. We're going to a guy that I have met before, and he is—he was a very, very cool guy, very nice, down-to-earth guy. To me, of course, it is Jeff Downs from uh, from Yes, and uh, this is the best album I think that he ever played on. It's my personal opinion. I love the Asia stuff too. Don't get me wrong; he's a great guy, but uh, I'm I'm a big fan of this record in particular. And I told him that when I met him, I met him when they were doing the Carl Palmer's ELP Legacy Asia Yes John Lodge Bill about five years ago in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. <laughs> and uh, I said, "Man, that's my favorite record you ever played on." And he looked at me and he goes, "I don't think you were even born when I made this record." <laughs> and I said, "No, Jeff, you're right. I mean, I was only 21 at the time, so." I'm almost 26 now. Ooh, yikes, getting old. But uh, anyway, yeah, Jeff Downs from Yes. Of course, he, uh, you know, he was in the band and then he left for like 25 years. But now he's back. He's been with them for probably 12, 13 years at this point. Anyway, rock on, Jeff. I love this. Machine Messiah, great stuff. Number 12 is the ever so atmospheric Mellotron guy. Of course, many of them are, but I'm talking about Ian McDonald from King Crimson. Yes, it's the same guy that formed King Crimson, also went and formed Forner way down the road, who I also love Forner, but we're talking about his work in King Crimson specifically on this album. I love the Mellotron work on this. The Mellotron keyboard, of course, it is so atmospheric. It, it, is, it gives you such a dimension when you're listening to the music. It adds a whole other dimension to the tune. Particularly Epitaph, but uh, yeah, he's all over this album. Ian McDonald, man. Great stuff. Number 11. Is Kerry Minier from Gentle Giant? Yes, yes. He is awesome. And the way, you know, like I said with Brent from The Grateful Dead, he really gels so well with the other guys in the band. And he's got a beautiful voice, too. Like, he gets these solo tracks where it is so different than all the other stuff that you hear with uh, with Derek Shulman doing most of the lead vocals and stuff. Uh, it's, it's you know, some of the stuff that he writes is very, um, you know, very almost like, almost like calm in comparison to the other chaotic tunes that they are sort of known for in a sense. But uh, yeah, he's awesome. And just, uh, just the whole, uh, just his whole thing, man. 
He's a great player, great singer, great writer. Love Carrie Minier. Love the extra added dimension that he brings to the music of Gentle Giant. And number 10. Well, we're at number 10 already. This is the only vinyl record I'm going to hold up here today. But it is Neil Morse. Of course, he's from Spock's Beard. He's from Transatlantic. He's obviously from the Neil Morse band, all that. A fantastic musician. Uh, he knows when to dial it back, and he knows when to go full throttle on it on the keyboard. You know, watching some of the solos that he does. If you go uh, watch some live Transatlantic stuff, there's tons of it on YouTube there. And he just rips into these amazing solos. It's like, wow. Like, this guy definitely listened to a lot of Yes growing up. <laughs> but he's a great singer, too. He's a fantastic songwriter. He's just kind of... He's the jack of all trades in the prog world, and he's one of the guys that's keeping the prog flag, prog flag flying in the 21st century. Him and all the other guys in Transatlantic. <laughs> but yes, Neil Morse at number 10. And at number 9, we're talking about another Dream Theater alumni, which you know Neil isn't really, but he has that connection with Mike Portnoy, so... That's good enough to, to, to mention. And, of course, to seg into Derek Sherinian. Yes, this is from the brand new Whom Gods Destroy record. Him and Ron Thal and, and uh, Dino Jalusic and uh, the other two guys who I unfortunately cannot remember the name. The bass player and the drummer, but all great musicians nonetheless. Um, Derek Sherinian is, is just a total madman. He knows when, you know, he's got classical moments on, these al on this album. And he's got full throttle metal moments here, too. Very interesting stuff, and of course his solo stuff, you know, the Planet X and, and you know, the actual solo Derek Sherinian albums are just great. Inertia is a great solo album from him, but Whom Gods Destroy, if you haven't heard this, check it out. It's beautiful, it's classical, it's heavy, it's proggy, it's all of this stuff. Prog metal, it's happening baby, Whom Gods Destroy, Bumblefoot, and Derek Sherinian going at it. Just going ham on it, my friend. Number nine. And number eight, many of you have heard of this guy before. In fact, if you are watching Brockway's Vinyl Bites, I guarantee that you probably were born or grew up listening to this band. But we're talking about Richard Wright at number eight from Pink Floyd. Yeah, again, like I said before, the atmosphere. I mean, he doesn't really do a lot of, you know, particular solos and stuff like some of the other guys were mentioning here. But uh, imagine Pink Floyd without Richard Wright. You know, you don't hear him ripping close to the edge and stuff, but imagine this band without him. That whole, that whole thing, that whole vibe that he brings to the band, uh, that whole open atmosphere with his keyboards and his synths and all the sounds that he gets and brings to the table is really interesting. And uh, it's, it's one of the things that attracts a lot of us to Pink Floyd, but maybe you don't know it. <laughs> he's like a, he's like a subtle... He's what he's like the subtle backbone and genius of Pink Floyd. Obviously, of course, with with uh, uh, Roger Waters, David Gilmour, and Nick Mason, and Sid Barrett, depending on what area you're looking at. But uh, he's kind of the unspoken hero of Pink Floyd, and uh, yeah, Richard Wright. Big praise to him. Love him. And we're at number seven of the many great keyboardists that Frank Zappa has had in his band, The Mothers of Invention. We are talking about George Duke, probably the most known or notable one. I love the dialogue that he has be you know, between himself and Frank, especially in the live setting, which is why we pulled out the complete Roxy performances <laughs> and uh, you know his work on cheapness and all this stuff, You know, especially the way he sings and the stuff he can play and sing at the same time. He's just astounding. And he's an amazing soloist. I mean, Inca Rhodes, come on, man. Woo! He's a happening player. He's a happening player. Pygmy Twilight, yeah. George Duke for the win at number seven. At number six, we are going to the hard rock territory. Uh, you could, you, you know, there is an argument, or there could be an argument that some of this is jazz, some of it's metal, but it's definitely hard rock. You know, in some people who grew up in the 70s, maybe metal wasn't as known of a term back then as it is now, but he's definitely a happening hard rock guy. John Lord. I mean, he plugged his organ into a Marshall stack. He's one of the first guys to do that. Um, of course, yeah, just John Lord. I mean, wow. Listen to him on Highway Star. I mean, that first solo, I bet so many people thought that that was a guitar solo before they realized, oh, 
That's actually a keyboard. Yes, it is John Lord. Big, big fan of him and all of his stuff in Deep Purple. I mean, good gosh. And Lazy, you know, that, that cool that cool heavy organ intro that he does in that song. Irreplaceable, my friend. R.I.P. to John Lord. Number six is John Lord. Number five is Patrick Moraz. I could have pulled out the story of I. I could have pulled out the refugee album or any of his other solo stuff maybe even the moody blues but i don't think that particularly his moody blues stuff i don't think it really gives a proper look at how he can play but this album certainly does it is the one and only album he did with yes uh this is probably their most jazzy fusiony album and uh you know he was the perfect guy to do this for for the band with the band just totally fantastic. The Gates of Delirium. Sound Chaser, the solo that he rips in Sound Chaser is absolutely unbelievable. And the pitch bending thing that he's doing all throughout the solo, wicked. And I don't really think it was very heard of at the time to do stuff like that. Of course, now lots of guys do it, but he was one of the first, man. He's an originator. Love Patrick Moraz. So number five is Patrick Moraz. Number four is... uh possibly one of his biggest fans and arguably the greatest keyboardist of the 21st century yeah we're talking about jordan rudas from dream theater oh my god this guy is everything you could possibly imagine he is an orchestra he's a classical musician he's a hard rock keyboardist and pianist and he's an amazing writer. All of this stuff. You know, I could have picked Liquid Tension Experiment and things like that. I could have picked any of his solo albums too. But we're going with Dream Theater. Listen to his work on The Best of Times from Black Clouds and Silver Linings. You know, the way he's got that whole entire orchestral beginning. The first probably four or five minutes of the song. It's a lengthy tune. Maybe it's the first three four minutes. I'm not entirely sure of the timestamp, stamp. But... Uh, Listen to him, listen to his work on that, and of course the rest of the album, the way he fits in with John Petrucci and Mike Portnoy and those guys is just unbelievable. And he's been with them for 25 years, and he's not going nowhere, man. Jordan Rudess, we need to cherish that guy, the multi-talented Jordan Rudess at number four. At number three, from my favorite band of all time, is Tony Banks from Genesis. Yes, he is one of the most beautiful, melodic players. Of course, he is an amazing songwriter, and he can rip solos with the best of them, too. I mean, you know, down and out from And Then There Were Three and stuff. Just great, just great. And, uh, you know, just thinking of the solos and stuff that he's written, the cinema show... Uh, Dancing with the Moonlit Night, the way he sort of trades off with Steve Hackett. It's like a call and response thing that they got going throughout that nine and a half minutes in that song. Fantastic. So here's the Selling England by the Pound album from Genesis. And um, yeah, you know, in, in just his chordal changes and things that he does. I mean, he is the master of chord changes, definitely. Key changes and all that stuff. Tony Banks is an absolute genius. So at number three, Tony Banks. Number two, yeah, you probably know who the last two guys are, but uh, I'm going to give you arguably the greatest keyboard album in rock history. And this is the Gold Disc Edition, Rick Wakeman at number two, from Yes, of course, and the Close to the Edge album. Yeah, this is the Gold CD. You can't really see it that well, but it is an SACD, and it's great sounding. I do have the Stephen Wilson mix of this as well. I'd reckon that Close to the Edge is, in fact, the greatest organ solo in the history of rock music. Uh, and of course, the synthesizer work that you get throughout And You and I, and Siberian Ketru as well. And even in Close to the Edge, when he's got that church organ in the middle of the, you know, before the solo starts at the 14-minute mark, and uh, he's got that, um, you know, in, in the I Get Up, I Get Down, he's got that really church, yeah, if you know the song, you know what I'm talking about, and I'm guessing if you're over here on Brockway's Vinyl Bites, you probably know the tune. But, uh, and then, of course, he rips into the greatest solo. Oh, I just can't even talk about it. It's so good. Ah, it's so good. All of his solos are amazing. Obviously, I could have mentioned uh, Six Wives of Henry VIII album, or I could have even mentioned his solo on Roundabout, but we're talking about Close to the Edge. Rick Wakeman is an absolute god, especially in the prog community. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Great writer, great everything. Love what he does. All of it. Number two, Rick Wakeman, and number one, yeah. Yeah, you know, probably the greatest keyboardist of all time. 
Keith Emerson from Emerson Lake and Palmer. Everything that that guy can do with his right hand, he can do with his left hand simultaneously. Um, and he can also do it, you know, flying upside down, literally hanging upside down in the middle of an arena uh, on a grand piano. <laughs> <laughs> that guy was an absolute freaking madman. Keith Emerson from Emerson Lake and Palmer. Check out Tarkus if you haven't heard it already. Of course, you won't go wrong with anything from the first five or six of their albums in their catalog. That's including the two live albums, Pictures at an Exhibition, and Welcome, my ba Welcome Back, My Friends, to the show that never ends. But uh, yeah, we're talking about Tarkus here. And uh, just some of the odd stuff that he would write and the way that 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 those three guys in that band gelled together. It is so perfect. I just can't even believe it. <sighs> I mean, listen to his compositions, man. That guy was on another planet. R.I.P. Keith Emerson. Love him to bits. And uh, miss him every day. Absolutely. So that is my top keyboardists, of course. There, there's going to be some that I think of later that it's going to be like, oh, yeah, the, that guy needs to be included too. That guy, oh, we missed that guy, but he's so great, all that stuff. So we're going to have to do that in a future video, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, but uh, this is sort of a part one to my favorite keyboardists ever. <laughs> you got 15 of them here, and we'll have 15 more for you in no time. But these are my absolute number one, or number one to 15, I should say, my go-to's. <laughs> they're all great you can't really rank them at any point in time they all could be number one you know what i'm talking about yeah you know what's up hey thank you so much for coming here to brockway's vinyl bites if you haven't already you should definitely hit the like button and the subscribe button because we have cool content coming here all the time you know what i'm saying my friend so yes thank you for watching today and don't forget to rock on <laughs> yeah